guys, welcome to my channel. My name is Reading Bear, and I hope you are ready for some more stories. And today, we'll take a look at some new entitled people content. If you enjoyed my content, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and post some bear emojis in the comment. And now, let's dive right into the stories. The first story is titled, Neighbor Destroyed My Fence With A Chainsaw. He is mentally insane. I have my fair share of experiences with crazy neighbors, but nothing that had ever scared me. Well, up until about a year ago, I had an experience with a neighbor that left my mother and I traumatized, and we ended up selling the house I grew up in just so we could get away from said neighbor. It all started when a little over a year ago, we decided to replace our backyard fence that separated our yard with the neighbors. The fence was decades old, and I was surprised it had lasted so long. It was a short fence, and in order to enhance the privacy of our yard, my mom wanted to get a taller fence. We ended up going with a six feet tall fence. This is where the story starts getting interesting. Our neighbor, Mike, is actually the owner of a construction company. He was frequently seen doing projects on his own home and driving around his construction truck with a bunch of different supplies and materials. Of course, we did not mind this, but it is important to the story. Flash forward to after the fence is officially installed, Mike wasted no time in complaining. First, he ended up complaining to my mom one day about the fence. Now, Mike was a pretty rough and gruff guy who was aggressive, so the interaction shook my mom up a little. Of course, she was confused as to how the fence was an issue in the first place. Mike had told her that we had no right to build it, and that we needed to take it down. I thought this was an odd thing to claim, because we had a fence there before, but it just was not as tall. It made me wonder why Mike's issue really was. A couple of weeks later, we had received a letter in the mail. The letter was actually from Mike's construction company claiming that we had no right to build the fence. I was even more confused at this, because first of all, Mike lived right next door to us, why did he need to send us a letter through the mail? Second of all, did a construction company have any right to tell us what we could do with our property? We received a follow-up from a lawyer claiming that we had no right to build the fence without Mike's consent first because it divided his property line from us as well. I did not know if these were legit, Mike was aggressive, so I assumed that he was taking advantage of the fact that he owned a construction company to make everything looks official. Well, imagine our surprise several days later when we were sitting on in our living room, enjoying a takeout meal when we suddenly heard a chain saw buzzing in our yard. Mike was in our yard, screaming and going on about God knows what, while sawing our fence down. And not only was he sawing our fence down, but he was also sawing every single post in the fence in half, completely destroying the fence. My mom was terrified. He was being so aggressive with his chainsaw, that we were terrified what he would do next. I ended up locking all of the doors and closed the blinds, because we were really scared that he might come into the house and start doing something. If he had the balls to cut down our fence with a chainsaw, who knew what else he was willing to do? We immediately called the police and handed over our security cameras as they caught him walking into our backyard, they did, upon further review. They did not immediately arrest him, I am not sure if they legally could, but regardless my mother and I were not going to stay in that house. Later that night, we packed a couple of bags of clothes and necessary items and ended up leaving the house. We stayed with my aunt for several months, while a court trial was being held. My mom was talking about selling the house, and although it saddened me to think about my childhood home being gone, I could completely understand why. We had no idea what they were going to do with Mike, or if he would be held accountable for his actions in a way that made us feel safe in our own home. Well, at the end of all of the court dates we decided to sell our house and bought a new home on the other side of town. Mike was convicted a breach of the peace because of his aggressive actions and for sawing down our fence. He was fined $350 and was issued a court order that would prevent him from making any contact with us or engaging in behavior that was deemed dangerous or aggressive. The next story is titled, Revenge on the Lowlife Landlord Who First Deprived Us of Heat and Later Kept Our Security Deposit. I was a kid back in the 80s two years out of college when I moved into an apartment by the shore in New Jersey. When the cold weather arrived, there was always a few days when the apartment was cold, we would tell the super, and then the heat would start arriving. One year the heat started decreasing in February, and inside the apartment was like in the 50s and we had to start wearing coats. We told the super about it and nothing happened this time. 
We wrote the landlord about it, and still nothing. So, we checked with an attorney and learned about warranty of habitability and withholding of rents. So, yet another certified letter to the landlord and we start withholding rents. He files a motion to evict us, and we answer with the Marini defense, depositing the withheld monies with the court. The judge finds in our favor for all the money with withheld. We continue to live there because there just aren't many other options as we save for a home. Flash forward to living there for six years, on the last lease because we are about to buy a home, we write in a clause that we can break the lease with 45 days notice in writing, similar to his 45 day clause. They don't notice it because it's slightly obscured on the top left of page 2, so they sign off on it and return it to me. So, in the middle of the lease, we give the 45 day written notice, make the rent payments, and leave. They don't return our deposit, so we sue for it, demanding double. They sue us for the remainder of the six months rent and refuse to return our security deposit. This is no longer small claims court, but we proceed without an attorney anyway, they are expensive. We arrive at the courthouse and court forces a round of arbitration. The arbitrator says we will lose in front of the judge and to pay the rent remainder. We refuse and wait for the judge. While waiting the landlord's attorney drops by and asks why we didn't take the arbitrator's advice, so we tell him about the clause we wrote in, and he states he saw it too, and that since it was crossed out, it's not part of the deal. We show him our copy of the lease where it's not crossed out, and his face goes white as a sheet. He makes a call to the landlord, who then offers to properly break the lease with no penalty and return our security deposit in full. We refuse, and we show him the certified letter stating that we would have accepted that deal up until yesterday, but that if you force us to come down to court, we want double damages of the improper withholding of the security deposit. He tries again to reach out to the landlord, but no luck this time. We go to see the judge. He looks at both leases and calls their attorney to the bench. The judge takes our lease and thrusts it toward their attorney and says, this is the lease in force. Their attorney starts walking around the courtroom like a chick with his head cut off, while I try to laugh as quietly as possible. The judge fines for us for double damages. We receive nothing for a week, and I go back to the courthouse where the clerk says, they should pay that judgment immediately, and tells us about chattel execution, and gives us that form. A couple of weeks pass, and a check appears from the landlord. Another month passes and we get a call from the court. They have our money. I told them the landlord had sent a check a while back so all it good. She tells us that we should have informed the court that we got the money to stop the chattel execution from occurring. The court sent the sheriff to their offices and confiscated office equipment and sold it at auction to satisfy the judgment. They said don't worry, they will just return the money to the landlord. That is the revenge, getting the money and having them experience the abrupt seizing of their assets at their place of business, having it sold at auction, and then having the money returned to them. Major Pro Justice. The next story is titled. Cancel a land lease and hope to make a windfall? Hope you like a lot of dirt. Let me preface this by noting that this revenge was not my doing. At least, not exactly. It happened back in the 90s when I was in high school and centered around the type of school I attended. So, in case you weren't aware, it's very common in agricultural communities to have what are known as farmer schools. That's not a technical term, but more just something easy to define them. The schools are generally organized by the local farmers, and while you still study the various courses needed to get into college, you also study farming technology courses, and get credit hours for work-study, i.e. working on one or more farms. The area I lived in was surrounded by a number of large farms which grew cotton primarily. So, during the year, we'd spend time out in the field both tilling, planting, and harvesting. One of the farms near the school, was these thousand acres spread that like the others grew mostly cotton, though sometimes they rotated to soybeans, or silage. Basically corn, but you don't harvest it. This farm had a long partnership with the school, so the students provided near free labor for the farmer. The farmer leased this property from some out-of-state owner and paid them a portion of the revenue from the harvest. Imagine my surprise then, when I and many of my classmates arrived at the farm to do our work study, and the farmer instructed some to crew the sprayers and start spraying herbicide on the fields, while others, myself included, were to take tractors and discs and plow everything under. The farmer wanted every square inch of the fields returned to just dirt. We were shocked, to say the least, but after some discussion we set to work. It took us the better part of a weekend to do so, and when we were done the field was in a beautiful, if barren, state. 
The farmer thanked each of us personally and paid us about $500 each. Quite the sum for a 90s high school senior. We returned to the school, told our headmaster that the contract was completed, and he informed us that the farmer would no longer be working with the school, and we'd be sent to one of the other larger farms for the rest of the year and our work study. It was probably two or three months later before word started going around about why we'd been instructed to destroy the crop. Granted, these were just rumors, but based on how things turned out for the farmer, I suspect there's some truth to it. So, apparently the landowner had decided that he was going to not renew the lease the farmer had on the land. This lease renewal just so happened to fall a few weeks before harvest season would start. Given that the average cotton farm earns about $1,500 per acre, a 1,000-acre farm would easily net the owner $1.5 million. About 500 k of that being pure profit. I don't know what the farmer's lease was, but it stands to reason that it wasn't anywhere near that. So, this landowner had figured out a neat little trick. Let the farmer get a good crop planted, and then refuse to renew the lease. The farmer would leave the plants in the field, and the landowner would just need to pay some contractors to come harvest it, and they'd earn a profit. Since at the time, the farmer's lease wasn't yet up, he decided to prevent that from happening. His act of revenge against the owner, was to prevent them from cashing in on their hard work. Sure, it destroyed his farm, and he had to sell off most everything he owned to buy some property for himself, but he'd proved a point. The owner did try to sue the farmer, though he, the owner, really didn't have a leg to stand on, or so I was told. I think the court ruled that since the farmer was still under the lease when he had the land tilled under, then it was his property to do with as he wished, and thus the landowner couldn't tell him what to do with his property. I learned a rather valuable lesson from that man, beyond what I learned about farming. That lesson was, never ever cross someone with nothing to lose. Edit. Since it was brought up in the comments, let me add some details here. Cotton is one of the few crops which leave a negative nutrient value in the soil. Meaning that after harvest, even if you till the dead plants under, or even if you till them prior to harvest, you won't have as much nutrients as you started with. That's why farmers will plant another crop, usually winter wheat, in place and then till it under rather than harvesting it. This is something commonly called a green manure, but it works to put nutrients that the cotton pulled out of the soil, back into it. While the ground wouldn't have been completely dead or sterile, any crop planted on that tract of land, without further treatment of the soil, wouldn't have produced the same acre per acre yield that a comparable crop would have had he gone to harvest, and planted the secondary crop. Which means that the landowner would either have to plant the green manure and spend money that way, or pay by the ton to use artificial fertilizer. The last story is titled, Thanks for the year of free rent in Brooklyn. So, a friend and I move into this newly renovated apartment in Brooklyn. It's nice enough, but just about every one of the 14 units has some sort of weird problem. One unit had the hot and cold water mixed up, flush a few times and get a heated toilet, one unit none of the outlets are grounded. One unit there are gaps around the windows. The problem in our unit was a leak in the air conditioner lines. The leak was probably at the roof, but we ended up with no AC. We call them and it takes a month to get someone. He refills the lines and a week later the problem comes back. We spend the summer getting the system topped up every week. At the end of the summer, they decided that our repairs, and all of the neighbors, were getting too expensive. So, they send us bills. Our bill was in the tens of thousands of dollars, recharging that system weekly must have been expensive. They also start trying to charge every unit for any infraction, like $100 for every unit for a single scrap of paper found in a hall. The tenants all get together to have a little meeting. It turns out that they never got a certificate of occupancy for the building. The city had it on the books as a furniture warehouse. So collectively we all just stopped paying them. Rent, fines, fees, nothing. We retain a lawyer and just live there. The company tried to get us out by cutting lighting and other services. We contacted the lawyer, the company would get fined, and we'd get our lights back. They tried to change the main lock once, but we let the locksmith know what was going on, so he stopped. They didn't try it a second time. The first floor of the building was an off-track bedding parlor. They were particularly noisy and obnoxious, so one resident called the health department over a moldy loaf of bread we found in the basement. One of my best memories was watching a bunch of guys in hazmat suits clear out the bedding parlor so they could run tests. Eventually they try to get the certs, but to do that they need to do inspections with the drywall removed. 
They tried to do it while we lived there, and the lawyer fought it for not being in a livable state. Finally, they realized they needed us out, if they got the C of O while we were still there, we'd owe back rent. They take us to court to get evictions. Lawyer gets everything pushed back as far as he can, but finally we go to city court. Lawyer points out that they're trying to evict 14 units, but you can't evict more than 10 at a time. Court ejects the case. I don't think their lawyer gets a single word in. So now we get a county court date for an ejection instead of an eviction. Again, lawyer pushes it out as much as he can, but eventually we go. Court agrees to eject us all but sees the evidence of lighting and lock tampering. Asks our lawyer what a reasonable time frame would be. Lawyer asks for four months. Judge gives us six. Everyone stays until the last month. At the end of it all, we got to live in a newly renovated apartment in a trendy area of Brooklyn for free for a little over a year. Thanks for listening.